and uh, and this uh, work, working Thursday evening to you know upgrade yourself and uh, learn something new. And I'm sure and I hope that I give complete value to this one hour that you are investing with us. Uh, I just want to give you a little background of why we are doing this uh, topic. You know, uh, in uh, since uh, this lockdown has begun, I've done close to 18 webinars and uh, close to 2000 people have attended uh, this webinars and it's been on various topics. Uh, out of this, in this 18 webinars, almost in 14 to 15 webinars, I've got a question related to ETF. You know, so might as well, I thought that if so, there are so many people who are keen to know about ETF, some of them have already been invested, some of them are on the verge and trying to find out whether it's an investment which is worth doing it or not. So I thought might as well just try and cover and let's do everything about ETF so that you then know whether you should invest in an ETF, what are the advantages or disadvantages and is it really a worth a product pursuing or it's just, you know, there is only a hype around it. But that is what we're trying to find and explore. Uh, like always, we are not biased towards any one product or any one company. So there is no uh, agenda to sell you or agenda not to dis not to sell you something. But let's try and explore whether this really works and fits our investment requirements or not. So let me just start with the. Uh, you know, uh, sh so should I start with my presentation here? Yeah? Uh, before that, uh, I was just coming to it. Before that, you know, if any of you would like to uh, share about uh, why would you like to know something about or what would you like to know in today's session, uh, you know, you can just raise your hands and uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll have you, you know, allow you to talk with us, just have a bit of a discussion in terms of, you know, what are your expectations with uh, today's webinar. So would uh, anyone like to share? <laughs> Doesn't look like it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not a very interactive seminar or webinar, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, we'll have a lot of Q&As at the end of the session, but uh, uh, if there's anything that is bothering you in ETF, and I hope that I'll cover all those things which I anticipate uh, you would want to know. But if there's anything specific or anything which is bothering you and you feel that uh, uh, is the burning, uh, you know, expectation that you have out of attending this, uh, probably it is a good time for you to kind of share. I think I'll put something in the chat box. I'll just get uh, you know, Arpan on the talk. <laughs> Arpan, just unmute yourself and uh, you, let's... Uh... So Arpan is saying that uh, he's uh, seeing all the topics which might cover all the expectations. Yeah, hi Saurabh and hi Jinai. Hi Arpan, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. So the slide which is being shared by Saurabh right now, the, all the questions mentioned in this slide covers most of all our expectations from this seminar. Great. So there is nothing left in this seminar uh, to be asked more. Correct. Okay. And we'll try and go as deep as possible and uh, get answers to all of these questions. That's sure, thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, Arpan. Awesome, awesome. So let's start. Uh, so let me just start with a very basic definition of what is ETF. This is an Investopedia definition. Uh, you might find it to be too boring, but uh, I mean, uh, or a bit technical, but that is how, you know, uh, financial uh, things are uh, kind of uh, mentioned. So ETF is a security that tracks the value of an index. So it's basically one single security which is traded on the exchange and what it does is that it tracks the value of the index. So there is, if there is a nifty ETF, it will track the value of nifty or it can track commodity. So if there is a gold ETF, then it will track the price of commodity which is gold or basket of an asset in the same way as mutual fund does. So what it says that it is nothing different from mutual fund. It is same to mutual fund, but it is a security which is traded on exchange. So it, uh, it tracks the values of those underlying assets, except it trades like a stock on the exchange, right? So it is just a mutual fund and it gets traded on the exchange. That is why the name is ETF, which is nothing but exchange traded fund. So let us do a very quick and basic thing as to how do you actually uh, trade or buy an ETF. Uh, very simple and uh, uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, expectation that 
know if someone so supriya likes to trade in stocks on her own through an online broker uh, she has rupees 50000 which she likes to invest and she has been hearing about etfs and starts doing research whether etfs make sense for her or not fortunately she finds that uh, uh, passive investment is performing very well and look up for some popular etfs for the same so that she can invest in a passively managed index fund uh, etf and she purchases the units of some popular nifty etf which she found through her research through her broker so if you want to buy an etf you will have to call up your broker or i mean if you're doing an online uh, trading or uh, investment then you have to do it through your online application uh, and uh, while like you pay brokerage while doing transactions in your uh, equities you have to pay a brokerage and like equities your units of the etf will be credited to your dmat account uh, similarly like mutual uh, equities after some time if you decide to sell it like after she decide to sell it again you have to contact the broker similarly do a sell transaction and again while selling you will have to pay a brokerage again so these expenses which are related to doing a transaction are paid by you separately to your broker and it has nothing to do with the value of the uh, of the etf so just to put it in a summary as an investor you go to your broker with cash broker through the exchange will put an order uh, there will be a counterparty which will be another investor and uh, the transaction will be executed and broker will deliver the etf units to you as an investor and will be credited to your dmat account so in mutual funds when you uh, and we'll go uh, we'll talk about this further so basically when you want to buy or sell uh, etfs you don't go to a fund house you actually go to your broker and do a transaction through the exchange and that is what is called exchange traded fund now let us come at why has it gained popularity so if you see this chart uh, uh, in 2005 uh, the total assets which were there in all the etfs globally put together was 426 billion dollars in last 14 years this has gone up to 6.3 trillion dollars and as this chart suggests it has gone at the rate of 18.6% so this 18.6% is not the returns that someone would have made on etf this is the rate at which the money uh, came into uh, etfs that's how uh, a lot of people got invested into etf and uh, it just uh, you know blew up from 426 billion dollar to 6.3 trillion dollars so uh, and you can see you know how the uh, charts bar charts have just yeah, kept on going up year on year and today it has become a massive industry so which uh, bring me to our first poll and uh, let's see what your view is why do you think has ets become popular so jine can we run the poll yes done that good good so why have ets become popular in your view what is your uh, uh, your feeling why why do you think it has become popular and it's a multiple choice question obviously you can uh, choose other things also if you feel important and if you feel that the reason why it has become popular is not mentioned you can also choose other and uh, put the reason in uh, in the chat box so 70% of the people have voted i would encourage everyone please to participate in uh, voting so that we actually understand what uh, what is going through your mind or so last uh, 10 seconds okay. let's go jane yeah i'm ending it you just share the results so as expected 67% of you feel that uh, it has become popular because it is a low cost investment vehicle uh, and i'll tell you why i say that you feel that and we'll discuss more on that uh, some of you feel that it is more evolved than etf uh, unfortunately that's not true uh, it gives you throughout the day pricing uh, that is true that uh, you can trade in etf because every second 
the price will get refreshed on the exchange like it does for any other equity stock uh, it helps in diversification it does not uh, because it's just like any other mutual fund so when you're investing in an etf or you're investing in a mutual fund it doesn't really help you in diversification we have uh, some people who have said that they want to share some reason in the chat mm. people saw good returns yeah i mean so some yeah so low cost is basically an uh, other side of the con coin to good returns that uh, uh, if the cost is low it will eventually yield to go, uh, good returns but uh, if you are seeing only from a good return perspective saying that you know it is the ability to give you better returns uh, just because it is altogether different product that is not the case like i said in the definition it etf is just like any other mutual fund with the only advantage that it gets traded on the exchange so it doesn't not really give you an opportunity to generate very high returns uh, the biggest reason why actually uh, a lot of etfs got popular is because uh, they were publicized as a low cost low cost uh, investment vehicle but uh, let us see what are the other things in my opinion what actually got popular was not etf basically passive investing gained a lot of popularity so uh, after the great financial crisis uh, of lately uh, people after the great financial crisis and of lately uh, people have realizing that a lot of fund managers do not have the potential to generate an alpha over index okay and even if they do it's very difficult to find such kind of managers so sorry up just a second you know in the chat box hakim has also said that risk is only limited to a uh, market risk so it's a less hassle you know just to with all the mutual so i am basically comparing ets with mutual funds yeah. uh, i mean if you compare it with a particular stock obviously that's true yeah. uh, but if you compare it with any other mutual fund then uh, it does not hold to then uh, um, Sure. and whatever risk that you will be associated with mutual fund will also be associated with uh, etfs etfs right so what gained popularity was passive investing because a lot of people felt that first of all it is uh, uh, it's way it's more costly to actually invest in active fund management and even if you do there is no guarantee that the fund manager would actually be able to beat the benchmark and create a significant alpha over it and that's why passive investment actually became very very popular and one of the tool to invest passively so i hope everyone understand what passive investment passive investment is where you just invest as per the index so for example nifty is the most popular index in india which has top 50 stocks in india so if you are investing only in those top 50 companies in the same way it is called passive investment i'm not trying to do anything different from what index is doing so i just passively invest uh, what are the com- the companies which are in nifty and uh, if i try to if i want to beat nifty then obviously i will have to invest in stocks in stocks which are out of nifty or do some juggling in the weightage so uh, that is active management and passive management is just simply following the index i think that is what gained popularity and like lot lot of you people said that it is very very hugely publicized that it's a low, low cost investment vehicle and that's why eventually it might help you in uh, generating higher returns uh, there is also flexibility to trade uh, throughout the day you can you know buy and sell every hour the prices might go up and go down and you might be able to do that but that's actually uh, might not be a very useful feature if you are a long term investor if you are investing for more than one or two or three or five years uh, then it might not be a great uh, flexibility and uh, tax efficiency so we'll talk about all of these uh, as we go ahead but these are the main reasons why it became really popular and are those are these uh, things really true or how do they really benefit is what we are going to see uh, one of the re- one of the things that i have seen is that the biggest pitch about etf is look so much money is coming in etf uh, etf so everyone is investing so you should also invest i mean it is not a great thing to do just because everyone is doing something should i do that is a big question mark so we know that it has become popular we know that a lot of people have been investing into it doesn't necessarily make uh, that thing the most desirable investment product 
and obviously we can't just shun it off and ignore it just because we know that there is so much of interest and that is why we are trying to understand whether it will work for us or not. So how is it different from mutual fund? We have been saying again and again that it is like mutual fund. Uh, you know, and this is a image that I downloaded from this company called napkinfinance.com, which is very beautifully put that uh, mutual funds or ETFs are almost same. What ETF does is that it will replicate the index. Uh, it will invest in like in, it was said in the definition, whether it is a commodity or a basket of stocks or a particular index. The only difference is that ETFs are bought and sold throughout the day in an exchange, while mutual funds are traded only once in a day, uh, which is at the closing NAV. So what what is essentially a difference? In mutual funds, the fund fund house, the company becomes your counterparty. So whenever you want to buy units, you buy it from the mutual fund house. Whenever you want to sell units, you sell it to the mutual fund house. So whenever you have to do the transaction, you go to the fund house. But in ETFs, uh, your counterparty is some other unknown investor anywhere else. So you buy and sell to that investor who, so if you are selling, there is some other investor who wants to buy and through the exchange, uh, the transaction is done. So your counterparty is another investor and not the exchange. Also what it does is that uh, it is like a combination of a mutual fund and a stock. So a stock is traded throughout the day but it has its own concentration risk and you know uh, when you're investing only in one company it doesn't give you diversification and you invest uh, in a single place mutual funds gives you diversification what ETF does is a combination of both but it is a security which is diversified but like a stock it is trading uh, on the exchange throughout the day and like I said um, when you are comparing mutual funds with the ETF generally uh, it's not a apple to apple comparison because uh, mostly in mutual funds uh, we talk about actively managed mutual funds and mostly in ETF it is all about passive management so like we just discussed that there is a close to 6.3 trillion dollars which is in size of the mutual fund, uh, ETF industry out of that close to 98 percent money is in passively run ETFs only two percent of the money is in actively traded ETFs, uh, active uh, ETFs, where the funds, underlying funds are managed actively. So basically when you're comparing ETFs, you should compare it with a passive fund and not with the whole of mutual fund industry. So just to give you another perspective, the ETF size, like I said, is $6.3 trillion globally. The mutual fund industry size is close to $54 trillion. So today also, even after so much growth, ETF market is just around 10-12% of what the total mutual fund industry is and it will not be fair to compare the whole ETF with the whole mutual fund industry when you have to compare mutual fund and ETF you have to compare ETF with the passively managed funds in the mutual fund industry. So I hope uh, I am able to give you a clear picture of what is the difference between a mutual fund and ETF. Now let's look at what are the advantages. Uh, in my opinion, there are three big advantages in mutual funds. Uh, apart from being which are being said, uh, I don't really agree with them. Uh, first thing is that in an ETF, uh, the cash positions are much lesser. See what happens in a passive fund? Like I said, the fund manager has to be very passive. The company has to be very passive, and it has to just replicate with what is invested in the index. The same companies in which they have invested. But in index funds. There are new investors coming in every day and existing investors redeeming out every day, right? So to honor those transactions, some part of money has to be kept in cash. So in index fund, compare it and it, it may happen in ETF as well. But because in ETF, the counterparty is some other investor, there is not the cash positions have not to be really high. So as compared to an index fund, uh, an ETF will have much lesser cash positions. So maybe even a, uh, an index fund might have a cash position of 4 to 5%. An ETF might have a cash position of 1, 1, 1 to 2%. So to that extent, an ETF is more invested into the passive, uh, the index which it is tracking. Also again, because there are no new money coming in or going out, the underlying fund experiences lower churn ratio or lower turnover uh, which happens 
So what is lower churn? That the stocks that I'm holding, I have to buy or sell them. And this might only happen if I see a lot of investors coming in or going out of my fund, which might happen in an index fund, but it, the chances of that happening in an ETF is far lower. So that is another advantage. And lastly, it can help you in having a hedging strategy. So uh, say suppose if I want to create a hedging strategy where I will say that I want to sell uh, my position at a particular level of index. So what ETF does is that it allows you to do that throughout the day, like because it is trading throughout the day. So suppose tomorrow I want to keep a position that I want to sell my Nifty uh, ETF at when the Nifty touches 11,800. So when it does, I can immediately do it throughout the day, uh, any time of the day, as soon as it happens. But in mutual fund, I'll just have to wait for the closing uh, NAV to uh, appear and only then I can do that because Suppose if market hits at 11,800 at one o'clock, there is no guarantee that you close above 11,800 at the end of the day. So I might not be able to run my hedging efficiencies very, very effectively. So these, I think, are the advantages of an index fund, uh, of an ETF. But as discussed, these are not the reasons why ETF actually became popular. I mean, I would really be surprised if all of you knew about this, or even some of you knew about these kind of reasons why ETF might score an edge over a passively managed index one. And that is very evident from various articles that I have downloaded from net that people only want to talk about cost effectiveness, diversification, it gives you better returns or, you know, uh, it has more tax efficiency, but uh, we'll see how, how that really works or not. Like we just said that, you know, as far as diversification is there, uh, transparency is there, liquidity there everything is same in mutual fund uh, in a passively managed index fund um, only advantages are uh, that they are lower churn comparatively and uh, also it might help you if you have created a strategy and you want to do a hedging only then an etf might help you so now let's look at uh, what are the disadvantages of a mutual fund of, of an etf uh, these advantages that we mentioned about low churn uh, or uh, lower cash ratio doesn't really help us uh, in uh, you know, achieving anything more. Uh, we don't know how it really going to benefit us. But let's look at these disadvantages and I think these disadvantages really impact us directly. So uh, first thing is that uh, when you invest in ETF, it involves an additional cost of brokerage. Because when you're doing a transaction in mutual fund, there is no transaction cost. You can just invest and redeem at any point in time. You don't have to pay any transaction cost. But uh, here, every time you buy and sell, you have to pay brokerage. Also, like index funds, where you can do an SIP, uh, there is no opportunity to do an SIP in a ETF because your broker might never give you any uh, SIP uh, facility. You will have to uh, diligently transfer the money every month to your broker and then instruct him to buy uh, money uh, that he needs every month, which uh, which is not a very advisable kind of uh, thing because uh, nothing beats uh, uh, you know, uh, things put on system and uh, things happening automatically. Uh, another thing is that uh, not all, but a lot of ETFs, uh, at least in the initial stage and some of them even now, only had a compulsory dividend option, which uh, completely defied the whole uh, need of compounding the returns. So uh, if I had invested in ETF, uh, whatever the gains and whatever frequency they wanted to declare, the gains were given out to the investors in form of dividend, which didn't really make sense because as a long-term investor, if I want to achieve my goals, I want to um, make the compounding work for me. And if I take those monies in dividend, then the compounding might not happen. Apart from these, these are other things that I've mentioned, which uh, which are I think are disadvantages in a mutual uh, in an ETF. Uh, one is uh, there can be huge differences in the NAV and prices. So remember, like any other mutual fund, ETFs also have an NAV. So the fund houses also declare an NAV, but in mutual fund, like I said, you do the transaction with the fund house, and in ETF you do the transaction with the uh, on the exchange at a price. The problem is that this price and NAV can be significantly different. 
So there's this recent article which appeared on Value Research. Uh, uh, and we all know that there was so much of turbulence in market from the month of March and April. And this is a chart of what could be the difference between the uh, price and NAV of the same index fund. Mind you, this is the same index fund. Uh, and these are four most popular uh, index funds that were available in our country. Uh, what could be the difference in the price and NAV of the same fund? So you see in the case of UTI, the difference even went up to as high as 30%. So imagine the NAV of the fund is 100 rupees and the price of the uh, same fund is maybe 130. You know? So if that, that difference happens, then the cost of the difference has to be borne by us as an investor. Obviously, this is a very, very uh, rare phenomena. But still you see that there is always a difference between the price and NAV of the, of the fund. And uh, for that, what I did was that uh, you know, this is the screenshot that I've just downloaded today uh, from Money Control. And it gives us the value, NAV and price of uh, some ETFs that are being listed. So for example, if you see the first ETF here, Motila Roswal NASDAQ, uh, the price is 894, while the NAV of that same fund is 876. Now the difference between this price and NAV is called premium or discount depending on where it is. So here if you see that the price is higher than the NAV. So the fund units are trading at a premium. So if you go to the fund house directly for and large investors can do that. If you go to the fund house directly, you'll be able to buy the units at the NAV which is 876. But as a retail investor, when we buy on exchange, you get at the price of 894. So imagine here only you are paying a premium just to buy the units. Now this, the uh, unfortunate part is that it will not always remain at the premium. In the very next line, if you see, there is Birla Gold ETF. Here the price is 4,695, while the NAV is 4,800, almost 4,799, which is 4,800. Here if you see, that the price is a discount of the NAV. So if you want to sell your units today, and you go to a fund house, you will be able to sell your units at 4,800. But if you are buying it in exchange, you will have, uh, if you are selling it in the exchange, you will have to sell it at 4,700. So this difference between the price and uh, uh, NAV actually can significantly impact the returns that you will generate. You might feel that these two are completely different asset classes and this discount and premium might have happened because of that. But if you see here, there are two mid-cap ETS which are also listed in the market, Motilal and ICIC Pro. Again, in Motilal, uh, uh, the price of the ETF is 17.93, while the NAV is 17.97. So here, uh, it is trading at a discount, uh, although it is a very minor discount, but it is still trading at a discount. While in ICICI, the price is 65.51 and the NAV is 65.02. So here ICIC is trading at a premium. So ideally you would want to buy at a discount and sell at a premium, but these things are not in our hand, right? Uh, we don't know when the price would be at premium. We don't know when the price will be at discount, but you are constantly, your returns are impacted by this movement in the price of the ETF day in day out. So I think this is one of the very big disadvantage. You know, you want to do the next poll now. Yeah, here it is. How much do you think is ETF cheaper? About that ETFs are low cost, and uh, that is one of the biggest reason why it became popular. So I want you to uh, estimate as to what do you think is the difference between an ETF and a mutual fund? How much cheaper is it? Is it less than 0.2% cheaper? Is it between 0.2 to 1%? Is the difference uh, 1 to 2% or is it more than 2%? How much cheaper is it? Uh, when, so how much money would you save if you invest in an ETF as compared to a passively managed mutual fund?
okay we've got 70% vote uh, people have voted uh, another 10 15 seconds before i wrap the poll up so anyone who has not voted i mean you know, kindly do it Let's move. Okay. Can you share the results? Yeah, please. Here it is. Awesome. So, seventy percent of you feel that when you invest in ETF, you are saving anywhere between one to two percent every year, and that's the advantage of investing in ETF. Fifteen uh, percent of you feel it is between point uh, two percent to one percent, and Eight percent of you feel that the difference can be even higher than two percent, and similarly, eight uh, percent of you feel that the difference can be uh, anywhere between zero to zero point two percent. So let's find out what's the difference. And uh, uh, I this is in line with what I was expecting. That a lot of you feel that there is a humongous saving which happens when you investing in an ETF. So let's look at what is the difference. In the expenses of a ETF and an index fund, so uh, I have chosen these two funds, and I will tell you the reasons. Uh, Nippon India ETF B is the oldest ETF which is available in India. It was formed by a company called Benchmark. Benchmark got acquired by Reliance, and now Reliance uh, is now being acquired uh, is acquired by Nippon. So now it has become Nippon India ETF B. This is the oldest ETF which is available in India. The expense ratio is 0.05 percent for the whole year. Um, the same fund house, when it is uh, when it is uh, giving an index fund option in the direct plan, uh, the expense is only 0.1 percent. So the difference is forget 0 to 0.2 percent, forget 1 to 2 percent. The difference is only 0.05 percent. Okay. 0.05 percent is 50 rupees on one lakh rupees of investment. Okay, so that's how low the difference is. Uh, again, SBI ETF. Why I took SBI is because SBI is the largest index fund which is in India. It has assets close to 73,000 crores. Uh, because it's a government-run company, a lot of uh, Government organizations uh, subscribe to SBI ETF, uh, ETFO, and uh, such organizations, and uh, uh, that because that, and that's why I took this. Surprisingly, here there is no difference at all. The ETF expense is also zero point zero seven, and the index fund is also at zero point zero seven. So whether you invest in an ETF or you invest in the index fund, the expenses are same. It is actually zero. There is no difference in expense or savings that you would get just because you have invested in an ETF and did not choose to invest in the index fund. Mind you, these are without any transaction cost. With the same expense, if you invest in an ETF, you will have an additional spending that you would have to do on the brokerages and maintaining your demat account. Now, let me get to something which is even counterintuitive. Uh, this is a sheet that I've uh, table that I've downloaded for this company called Investment Company Institute. Uh, what this says is actually reverse. This says that an average expense of all the index equity ETFs is 0.2 percent. Obviously, the trend is that the costs have been going down, but as on as in 2018, the average expense was 0.2 percent, while that in index fund was only 0.08 percent. So index funds were cheaper than ETFs by about 0.12 percent, and same goes with bond ETFs. So bond ETFs were trading at uh, were having average expense of 0.16 percent, while bond index funds had an expense of only 0.07 percent. So it is completely an eye wash that a lot of us feel that uh, ETFs are actually low cost. They are actually not. Uh, the expense rate difference. Is only five bips to maximum ten bips, and like we saw in some cases, there is actually no difference uh, in the expense. And in fact, the expenses might be higher because you might end up spending money on brokerages and maintaining your uh, demat account. Uh, so let's let's that let, that's bring me to our third and uh, 
final poll for the session today. I hope uh, this is all making sense to you. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Should I share the poll, uh, Zara? Yeah, yeah, let's start the poll. Okay. So sorry. Yeah, here it is. So when we do investments in index funds, there is a concept of tracking error, which is the cost that we pay as an investor. So I just want to know about how our investors are, they know about it. So do you really know what is tracking error and what is its impact when we're investing in index fund? Okay, so last 10 seconds for those of you who have not voted. I'm ending the poll, sir. Yeah. And here are the results. Great. So, Good. So 30% uh, of you know what is tracking error, but 70% of you don't know what tracking error is. And which is another big expense that we as an investor have to pay when we are uh, investing in a passive fund. So what is tracking error? Very simply put, uh, uh, if I'm investing in an index, right? I'm a passive investor. I'm just copying all the stocks that are there in index. So if the index goes up by 10%, the value of my investment should also go up by 10%. It should really match with the index. If the difference is higher or lower, it is an error, which is called a tracking error. In most of the cases, uh, the returns would be lower. And this lower is, is the tracking error expense that we have to pay because the fund is not able to match the returns, which is generated by index. Now it can happen because of various reasons. Uh, one of the reason is because of there is a cash inflow and outflow happens. Also, uh, one of the reasons that the constituents of index gets changed, right? So when the constituents get changed for the index, it doesn't incur any cost, right? They just have to remove one company and add another company. But for the fund house, it actually uh, incurs a cost because they have to sell all those stocks and buy the stocks of the new uh, entrant company, which might take some time and eventually lead to a difference in return. So if invariably there will always be a difference in returns that you might get uh, by while doing a passive investment and that difference is called tracking error so it goes without saying the fund which has the lowest tracking error is the best fund to invest into because they are able to keep up with the change that is happening in the index and the impact of that change is not borne by us as an investor so What happens is that in ETF, and this is a study that I've done myself uh, in a in-house study that we've done, is that because of this difference in NAV and price, the tracking error that we would experience on ETF is way higher than any other uh, index fund. So we've taken Nifty Bs. The only reason why we've taken uh, Nifty Bs, which is the Nippon uh, fund that I just showed you, is because, like I said, it is the oldest available ETF, and because it is the oldest, it has the maximum data which is available for us to do the testing. So I've done this testing from 2013 uh, for a one-year investment return on everyday rolling basis, right? So this has about, uh, if I am not wrong, about 1400 data points, right? And this is the average of those 1400 data points because it's done on a daily basis for a one-year return. If you see, uh, these are various index funds that are available that uh, we have tracked. Now, uh, IDFC fund has the lowest tracking error. Uh, UTI is very close to it. Uh, same goes with uh, Nippon index fund itself. Uh, obviously, like I mentioned that there is an advantage in the ETF because there is no low churning and low cash percentage. That's why if you see the on the basis of NAV, the Nifty B CTF has the lowest tracking error. But NAV is not available to us as an investor. We only have to do the 
investments or transaction on the price and once we do it on the price which is available on the stock exchange the tracking error just zooms up almost four times and uh, it is 0.7% which is way higher than any other index fund it's almost double more than double of the tracking error of various other index funds so when you are investing in an etf a uh, you are not saving much on the expense b you pay brokerage and c because there is huge difference between price and nav it leads to a huge tracking error so the difference that we saw between the price and nav on an average leads to an expense of 0.7% per annum so imagine you are saving only 0.05% in expense but eventually you might end up paying 0.7% in form of tracking error i hope i have made this is this clear and if there is any question please feel to ask at the end of this so what i did is very interesting is that i took a, a real life case that if someone would have invested in idfc nifty which is the index fund with the lowest tracking error and if someone would have done investment in nippon etf uh, just because i have done my back testing on nippon etf uh, what the result would be so if someone decided to invest 1 lakh rupees in either of this on 1st january 1919 this was the nav of uh, of idfc nifty fund and this was the price closing price of nippon etf on that particular day on 1st january 19, uh, 2019 uh, i have added 0.3% uh, brokerage to this transaction and obviously there is no brokerage here so uh, in idfc you will get 4430 units in nippon etf uh, etf you will get 8, 874 units on 31st december the value is uh, 112539 and here in nippon etf it is 112627 now the difference between idfc Uh, expense expense of idfc nifty and nippon etf is 10 bips okay so expense ratio like i showed for nippon etf 0.05% the expense ratio for idfc nifty is 0.15% but when you see at the end of the year this is only 0.08% and that is because of this tracking error so yes nippon etf has given a very very 100 rupees more return on 1 lakh rupees but the difference is only 0.08% at the end of the year but i would want to show you what happens because of tracking error this is as on 31st december what would have happened if you would have sold the units just 4 days before or earlier on 27th of december on 27th of december uh, the value of 1 lakh in idfc would have become 1 lakh 13255 while the closing price basis the value of nippon etf will only become 1 lakh 12985 so here you can see that etf has given better returns uh, sorry nifty index has given better return than the etf and this fluctuation where sometimes the returns are higher than the index fund and sometimes the returns are lower than the index fund is because of the uh, difference between price and, uh, and difference between price and nav which is nothing but the tracking error so as an investor you would want to avoid this fluctuation because these are not in your control and you can't really uh, you know neither you can time it or nor you can compare it it might be at a premium today like in, and just after four days uh, you know it might go on a discount or twice a versa so i think these are the biggest reasons why i feel that which highlights the disadvantages of investing into an etf so uh, clearly with all those things uh, we feel that it does not i mean that's our personal view completely uh, does not really make sense to invest in an etf so who should eventually really invest in an etf uh, i think etf uh, uh, are for large institutional investors uh, like i mentioned etf for you know there are huge treasuries of some uh, big organizations uh, Uh, nps and these kind of organizations which are you know which are going to invest crores of rupees and they have uh, they are going to hold this investment for 20 30 years very very long time right you can't imagine uh, epf for selling equities or bringing down their equity allocation once they have decided that they want to stay at 10% equity for as long as epf is going to function they are going to hold those investments right so the holding period is very very long 
and because they are very large organizations they can deal with the fund house and invest directly at the nav so for these organizations the etf units get created like i just told you that sbi etf uh, aum is 70000 crore on uh, the aum of nippon etf is only about 3000 crore so how did it go from 3000 to 70000 how can that happen that will happen with issuance of new units so if you are a large investor you don't have to buy it from the exchange you can directly approach the fund house and say that look i want to buy this many crores and i don't want to be subjected to this price movement and you issue me the units at the nav and that is what fund house do the new new units gets created which is only possible for large institutional investors so all in all all these three points are same that if you are if uh, etfs are best suited for large institutional investors and i think that's why huge amount of money uh, got into etfs because it became more and more easy for the large institutional investors to do transaction and uh, uh, that 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 that's why the aum size is just uh, kind of swelled up and lastly if you feel that you are an active trader and you have created some strategy and you want to hedge at uh, some one time only then probably etf might be something of value to you but uh, if you are a you know pure long only investor who is just who wants to just buy and hold for a long term and uh, you know achieve the financial goals and really don't i mean we uh, suggest our clients not to look at the prices of their investments daily basis what etf does is that it forces you to Uh, watch the prices of your investment on a minute by minute basis which is completely uh, uh, counterintuitive so unless and until you uh, only if you have a hedging strategy in place and you want to uh, take uh, you want to take the advantage of that uh, hedging opportunity uh, probably etf would work for you otherwise for long term uh, retail investors who want to invest via sip or accumulate unit month on month basis over uh, till they achieve their goals i think etf is really of not much sense so that's that's all from my side i hope i have just finished on time <laughs> and, uh, yeah i'm open for q and a thank you so yeah. much awesome you know amazing sara you know you as usual tons and tons of you know quality data quality understanding great nuggets to take away from so you know before we jump into q and a i would just uh, request for a feedback of this wonderful session of sara yeah sure please uh, yeah okay so while the feedback is on i'll start the q and a sure all right so the first question uh, you know before i assimilate all the questions that have been coming on q and a boxes i what i want to understand is uh, you know tax efficiency of etf as a product so you know if you could just touch upon that please yeah so i mean so many uh, things have been written that it is more tax efficient surprisingly uh, you know it is just a borrowed concept from the west uh, in india etfs and mutual funds are taxed at a similar uh, manner so there is actually zero tax efficiency uh, what happens in us and that i am believing from what i have read i'm not very sure it might have to want to check the facts is that in mutual funds the trans uh, the uh, taxation is transferred to the investor so the fund houses don't pay the tax uh, in india the fund houses are exempted and every time the transaction happens in the underlying funds the tax has to be borne by the investor like it happens in aif in india yeah. uh, but it doesn't happen in mutual fund uh, while in etf uh, the it becomes tax efficient because a uh, it is a passively managed fund and b even if the transaction happens uh, the transaction cost has to be borne by the investor and not the tax so it is a completely borrowed concept from the west in india there is zero tax advantage as far as etfs are concerned So, although I had mentioned that uh, okay. one of the reasons why it became popular, but I just wanted to highlight that there is another point that has been advertised. But in India, there is no tax efficiency as far as ETFs are concerned. Okay, 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 great, great. So, uh, you know, Arpan, the uh, some uh, we spoke to Arpan in the start of the webinar. So he's got a very interesting question. Uh, by the way, you know, Arpan is my college mate. We studied for CA together and. Uh, during our inters and we we've, we've done all those you know uh, nights of studying together i hope you know arpan remembers those nights uh, those days and you know those times so phenomenal uh, 
so what he is asking here is uh, you know so first of all what there is if there is a change in composition of nifty so in different etf funds you know due to different timing or different rate at which the fund manager buys the shares now what is the impact on that fund's performance at that point when the composition changes that is what we say that is one of the reason uh, is the tracking error right because uh, you know like uh, say for example if like what happened with satyam what happened with yes bank you know if uh, the stock has to go out and you know there are huge organizations which are holding huge positions they really have to you know just sell everything in one day and after an event has actually played out see in index uh, the uh, the stock might only be removed up you know only after math right only after the event has played out so uh, that is what unfortunately the passive investment is subjected to there is no escape to it and uh, if if a uh, in if a stock is removed from the index and new stock is admitted there is always this thing that has to happen in index uh, in uh, in uh, whether it is in passively managed index fund or an etf that they have to change the underlying asset and which results to what is what what we saw is the tracking error okay great great so i hope you know arpan that uh, answers your question yeah, i mean that is one of the reason for tracking error otherwise like i said that one or two percent money is kept in cash yeah. there is investors going and uh, coming in but those are not really very big reasons in mm -hmm. my opinion the biggest reason for having a tracking error is when the constituent changes in the index mm -hmm. but yeah everything is managed uh, the whole difference is then eventually by that uh, tracking error. also because there are funds which Like we said, that the fund is charging an expense of five bips or seven bips or ten bips. Yeah. In index, there is obviously no expense. So all those things lead to a tracking error. So all those costs put together is a tracking error which one has to bear. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So next couple of questions are from uh, Puneet Rastogi. Oh, awesome. Uh, <laughs> what he's asking is if large organizations, basically, you know, when they invest in ETFs compared to retail investors so does it not increase the risk risk component you know for smaller investors when these big guns come in no i mean because they are investing in the same stocks and there is ample enough liquidity because generally you would see that etfs are mainly uh, constructed for very large companies which are very very liquid so uh, uh, what has happened in fact uh, if you see the only way it can impact retail investors like what you saw in 2018 19 Where Nifty prices did not fall as much uh, as compared to mid cap and small cap index, and one of the reason was that so much of money was flowing in ETF, either because of TPF, uh, like in EPF or MPS, uh, which was a compulsory contribution uh, as far as government employees are concerned. That uh, uh, the these organizations didn't have any choice but to pump in money in the stock of these stocks. So only to that extent, the prices might stay inflated because of the liquidity. Uh, that these uh, big guys are infusing, but doesn't really impact small investors. I mean, uh, if the prices are going to go up, if you are an existing investor, it is all the more good for uh, you as an investor because prices are going up. Okay, great. And the next line of question is: uh, is is gold ETF better or you know SGB? So we did this session on. Uh, uh, you know gold investing and uh, you know I, we feel that hands down gold uh, sgb beats uh, etf see if you are a secondary market investor uh, and you want to buy sgb through you, through the exchange which are listed on exchange then you are subjected to the same difference as an etf is subjected to right now sgb gives you two very big advantages one is it is paying you to invest in gold so you will get an additional interest of 2.5% for every year that you hold the sgb bonds and second is that if you hold it to maturity all your capital gains are tax free right so uh, you are subjected to the same amount of tracking error whether you invest in an etf or you investing in a secondary market in sgb but in sgb you get 2.5% paid every year plus all your returns are tax free so i mean there is absolutely no point as to one why would one want to invest into an gold etf hey okay. hey okay. That is true. SGB trumps uh, the gold ETF any day. Yeah, yes. Very true. Very true. Mm -hmm. So the next question is from Vinod. Uh, he's saying that you know between uh, Bharat 22 ETF, ICICI, and CPSC ETF or Nippon, you know, 
He's saying, you know, just just give me a view, just give me a review. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what kind of views you like. Uh, you want to have. So the session is really about you know whether ETFs. In fact, want to compare between ETFs and passive ma- passively managed index funds. What makes sense? And clearly, as what we have derived, I think passively managed index funds score better. But uh, obviously, there are various options. So um, these uh, you know Bar Twenty Two ETFs or CPS ETFs. I mean, there is there are feeder funds for that, and you can also invest in index. Uh, Funds also there are fund of funds which are available, mm-hmm. but if you ask me from whether it is a good investment to do, uh, see what we feel is that these uh, both the indices are typically investing into PSU companies, and PSU companies have their own agenda, right? You might have best of the best PSU companies which are into monopoly businesses and still making losses, right? Because government's agenda is not to create profits but to uh, you, to serve the country, right? We all know what is happening with Air India. Uh, and so and so forth. There are empty number of companies which are into monopoly businesses and still not been able to generate enough cash flows and profits. So if you're someone, and uh, that is the reason why they also traded a very good discount to the earning. I mean, you would rarely see a PSU company trading at a very high PE multiple. So if you are someone who's interested into invest into that particular sector and take that risk of investing into PSUs. Then probably you know uh, you invest through an ETF or you through an index fund. That's uh, a second separate thing. I mean, we would always, uh, as we can see, I mean, we would have to tra- see what is the tracking error of the pr- price ETF and the index which is available. But uh, uh, th- there is a huge risk by you know getting yourself confined to one particular sector, and especially uh, PSU companies. Correct, correct. I mean, sort of you very nicely said, uh, you know, the agenda of the PSU uh, company or the government for mm-hmm. running a PSU is to serve the country. I mean, in, <laughs> otherwise, it's, sometimes the agenda is also to come back after five years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's one more question, you know, that is that that from my end uh, that I want to ask you is that so during these times where there are there is a lot of these, you know, ETFs, there is index investing, there is there's so many plethora of investment options that are going around. I mean, it just confuses any person, you know, who wants to get in, get in. And plus, there is this unrelentless, I mean, not, uh, relentless media noise around uh, what you should do, what you should not be doing. If Warren Buffett says something, I mean, it is trending for a couple of months. Uh, what should a what should a retail investor do in these times? I mean, that's a very, 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 very open-ended question. Uh, so, I mean, what I'm trying to probably come at is, uh, you know, uh, when there is such a basket of options available, what what should you create your own basket as? So, I mean, we do a completely different webinar on that as to how do you select investment products. But I think the whole crux is that you, for you to understand that there are four asset classes, which is equity, fixed income, real estate and commodities, which is mainly in form of gold. And depending on what your risk attitude is and what what is the tenure of the goal that you want to achieve, you really decide on your investment product. But uh, I mean, changing your strategy with uh, events is actually not a very great thing to do. You might just want to rebalance uh, the assets that you have. But to change the whole strategy and change the composition of your asset allocation uh, because uh, an external event has happened, is really not advisable and I think to answer it from another perspective I don't know if that is what uh, addresses your point is to try and keep things as simple as possible like you know you want to do some passive investing probably you want to have some exposure towards active investment have some fixed income and that's about it you don't need more than four or five funds in your portfolio and then you just stick to them so I think that does the job rather than trying to find complicated products and you know getting in uh, exposure to sectors and no such kind of things. Great, great. You know, I mean, that's that's the reason why a lot of these legendary investors keep on saying that you know it's simple, uh, and we have to keep it simple. So, okay. with that, you know, we'll uh, wrap today's session. I think you know it was brilliant uh, as usual. Tons of insights. Uh, you know, thank you, Saurabh, for taking your time out and you know educating all of us. Thank you. Thank, thanks to all the participants for coming in and asking questions and your valuable feedback and participating in the service. Thank you so much. Okay.